doctors think about medicine. <clears throat> the Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Nothing hard hitting in the news here this evening, but a comprehensive conversation, I hope, in what are we going to do in a half hour's worth of television to solve all of our medical issues, right? But uh, we have an esteemed couple of guests here this evening to talk about, you know, what the doctors think. There's so much reporting that goes on about medicine and yada, 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 but there's not, and there's a lot of criticism that goes on of the medical industry right now, but we don't get a lot of, um, I don't know, insight into the introspection that doctors do, unless you're sitting with your doctor. And if, you're, and if you've got a good rap with your doctor, I'm very fortunate to have an internist since I came to Rhode Island that has, I, I, I feel, is a friend as, as much as a guy that's going to tell me to lose the 10 pounds, or actually the 20 you know I have to lose. Um, you, if you probe, if you ask, they will tell you. If you don't ask, they probably won't. Um, but I'm sure as customers, we are running into all sorts of issues of supply and demand. Uh, not unlike the, the supply chains that were all stuck, we've got all sorts of like bubbles in, in the medical world right now when it comes to young people and the profession that they choose and you know, what specialty do you want and you know, what kind of medicine do they want to get into. And so uh, we'll have a conversation about that this evening. There's um, a national story, I think, that highlights some of the conditions around the country that I think is worth starting with. It seems like common sense. If you want to stay healthy, you schedule regular checkups with your doctor. But if you've been searching for a primary care doctor in 2023, the reality is it isn't as simple as it once was. It takes weeks to get an appointment with an internal medicine doctor right now. The Clues family experienced those delays firsthand. The longtime Roseville residents found out their primary care physician was leaving and it took longer than expected to transfer to a new one. We worked about two and a half months, and then once we did have a physician that did take us, it took another month before the appointment. They're not the only ones. They've met others with tougher luck. Some of them are taking like five months, I think. So why is that? We're starting at the beginning. Is there a lack of people pursuing the field of medicine? Well, the short answer is no. Medical schools actually decided to increase their classes, but we what we found out was is that we were not increasing the number of residency spots as fast as we were graduating more medical students. More students graduating, but more slots needed for them to complete their residencies. The big demand is in the field of primary care. So if there's a need, why aren't students eager to fill that gap? Medicine is changing so fast and there's so much information. It's very difficult to be a primary care doctor to have to know so much medicine. And so people sometimes decide that they would rather be a specialist and therefore know one area of medicine very well. There's no putting a Band-Aid on the urgency patients are feeling right now. But for the Clues family, seeing the expansion of residency programs is a hopeful start. The new generations coming through, it, it definitely is needed. Right, that's a pretty good comprehensive look. Dr. Jack Resnick is the immediate past president of the American Medical Association, kind of a small gig. Um, Brown is his Rhode Island orientation, but you're a Louisiana guy, right? Grew up in Louisiana, came to Brown for college. So welcome home. You are actually um, headlining a, an event that you're seeing the show, of course, on Friday and Sunday. I'm taping on Thursday, loyal viewers will know that, and the uh, Rhode Island version of the American Medical Association, the Rhode Island Medical Society, is having its awards night tonight, meaning Thursday, and ha it happened a couple of nights ago, um, which is nice. It's nice to, I mean, every profession likes to uh, honor its own, and, and that's what was going on. And Dr. Bledsoe, of course, is the president of the board of directors of the Rhode Island Medical Society. So great to have you both. Thanks so very much for, for coming. Thanks for having I'd us. I'd ask you how last night went, but uh, it's kind of <laughs> hard to predict, uh, although I'm sure things will be smooth sailing. And it's important to kind of recognize the professions. 
right, the professionals in the profession. So the so the, you know the heroes in our work are the patients, but uh, 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 physicians do a lot of hard work and do a lot of good work to help patients. And with anything, even in a team of superstars, you have people who are rise above and beyond. So. Uh, inspire their colleagues and really help patients and we're, we're very pleased to be able to recognize a number of those individuals this evening. The heroes in your work are the patients, what do you mean? It's really hard to be a patient. When I, I have a medical student this morning and the medical student wanted to go and see a patient and come back and report to me and the medical student was nervous going into the room and I say to the medical student, you got nothing to be nervous about, this is a grade for you. That patient might find out today that they have cancer, or that we might find something serious about them. So, so getting through illness is what keeps the doctors going. Watching patients get through illness, and 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 the, and the patients inspire us. W hopefully, we rise to the challenge. Hopefully, we give them excellent care. Some of our colleagues give really excellent care that we wanted to recognize. Give them a pat on the back. Give them a hug. Give them an in-person handshake. Uh, mm. after a couple of years of uh, COVID. Well, you know, the thing, it's really interesting, the, the bedside manner is, is something that is a cliche um, that we've, we've relied on for a long time. Um, I, hear, I hear, not to jump into a criticism of the industry, but I hear more and more complaints about bedside manner um, simply because of the flow of patience that seems to, to move through. And just because you're a doctor doesn't mean that you've got, you know, a wingspan of psychological good health to be offering all the time. You know, you know what I'm saying? It, it, am I am I on the right track? Do you talk about this within the industry? Well, I, I think you know we have the TLC we, aspect yeah. of everything. Well, Dan, thanks so much for having us both. No, you bet. And, I, you bet. and I I think it has been a tough three years for the profession. And I sure. think as we have, uh, you know, it's one of the great things about my job as AMA president over this last year has been to get to travel the country and see amazing physicians on the front lines in different states facing very similar challenges and some different challenges around the country. But, you know, physicians have faced all the disinformation that we've had to fight back against and anti-science aggression and patients seeing things that just aren't true on Facebook. And so that's occupying new time in our visits to help work with our patients and educate them about that. Facing all kinds of burdens that insurance companies are putting in the way that make it sometimes hard to get patients the care they need. So in addition to being present with our patients during that visit, I think there are a lot of other things that have contributed to some burnout that may be what you're, what you're alluding to. You caused me to ask a question that I, I don't want to draw you into a political conversation, but is the pounding that Dr. Fauci got and still kind of gets a trickle-down problem for the industry? I, it's just another example, I think, of the politicization of science that we've seen over these last few years, and it's, it's troubling. I think as I look at, again, organized medicine and the importance of the work that we do, in past years, I would say 95% of the stuff that we work on wasn't politicized. And of course, there are a few issues that when you wade into, people are going to see through their, their lens of their political worldview. But now, you know, whether it's COVID and vaccines and masking, or whether it's reproductive health care or Medicare payment or anything else, um, we definitely are in a fractured country where, where that makes jobs, our jobs as physicians and scientists more difficult. So we've been thinking a lot about our continued work to depoliticize science to make sure people know where to go to get the right information. The good news is most patients, in my experience, and, and I suspect you see the same thing, still trust their own physicians. So we have a special opportunity and a special um, privilege uh, to get to sit down with our patients and, and share some science. Speaking of that, so uh, irony, I guess, I got a text from a friend and neighbor two nights ago, asked me for the name of my doctor because his was ghosting him. Oh. Hit the term he was using. Oh, not even leaving the state or leaving practice, just not responding. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, so I gave it to him. And as I gave it to him, I'm thinking, hmm, uh, my doctor, who I admire and, and, and rely on, has told me that the practice is up to here. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether I am loading up a situation or whether he's going to get ghosted again. But it goes to the point of market availability right now. So what's, what's the truth? What's going on? What's going on in town? Then we'll talk about the national trend. Well, in in town, uh, we've been talking for the last ten or fifteen years. Those of us in primary care, looking around at others who do what we do and the age distribution of people who do what we do, 
and there have been fewer and fewer people going into primary care in mm -hmm. Rhode Island. Uh, family medicine, pediatrics, uh, general internal medicine, and uh, and the group of us, the bubble, uh, is approaching thinking about retirement. Yes. And there are not enough uh, f as my guy is fresh young faces yeah. coming along. Well, they're PAs. It's all PAs. It just feels like the whole world is a PA right now. Well, Dan, I, I appreciate your shining a spotlight on this workforce issue. And I think the, the piece that you aired at the beginning of this show really captured the, the shortages that we're having. And it's true, they're all over the country. And this used to be a rural phenomenon. It's now in big cities, suburban areas, rural areas. There's absolutely a severe shortage of primary care physicians, but actually we're seeing it in many specialties now. I happen to be a dermatologist in my day job. It takes mm. six months in my area to get in to see a dermatologist, a rheumatologist, an endocrinologist. So, so it's a pretty significant problem, and I, I suspect most patients are, are experiencing this. So, so I, you know, it's, it's, so, it's funny that you say that because I have a dermatologist, and I have this, and I have this, and I have this, and this. And what's interesting, what I'm finding is, and especially in COVID, when people were looking for vaccines, my doctor, my internist, you know, told me about the, and, and the staff, you know, over a, a 25 year period of time, you get friendly with everybody, right? And, and, they, and they talk to you. And they were telling me that, that the vaccine pressure, when everybody was looking for the vaccines when it first came out, the calls to the doctor's office were nonstop. It was like ding, 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 ding. And there were a lot of no's, can't do it. And my doctor was saying, listen, if you're not a customer, then you're not on the top of the list. And if supply and demand is a problem, then you're not going to be able to you know, get in our door. He says the problem is, in, in, in some ways, that patients, meaning people, don't become patients until they are in trouble. And when they are in trouble, they are looking for a specialist or an internist, whatever the case may be, to immediately respond to their problem. This, but this they don't is, have an ongoing customer relationship. Yeah. Well, this is why it's important for patients to have an existing relationship with a great primary care doctor. And go get your skin checked and, on and, a regular basis before you have a problem. To do all their preventive work. But at the end of the day, all of this really comes back to having an adequate workforce. Okay. And when we think about having enough physicians out there to provide all that care so that every patient does have a primary care physician and every patient does have access to specialists when they need them, I kind of think about it in two different pieces. So if you... If you think about a pipeline or a pathway, you got people coming in, and as that piece alluded to, we don't have enough residency positions to train enough physicians in this country. Med schools have grown a little bit, but the next stage of training, which is residency, is actually funded through the Medicare program. And we've been begging Congress for 20 years. They froze the number of residency positions in 1997 and have not significantly what increased was the rationale? it since the at that time, they thought maybe we had enough physicians, and it's and it's expensive. But this is an investment, and in our population is aging and growing, and it's an investment in the in the health of our population. The other thing, though, and and Tom alluded to this a few minutes ago, is there are things that are driving physicians, particularly mid and late in their careers, out of the back end of that pipeline. And the worst thing we can do when we have a shortage is to actually take physicians who've gone through all those years of training and lose them early, whether it's because you know, we have insurance companies putting all these barriers. What makes physicians unhappy and burn out? It's actually the things that get in the way of doing what drove us to join medicine in the first place, taking great care of our patients. So when insurance companies make us spend hours on the phone arguing over sometimes even a generic medication for our patients that's been out there for 40 years, mm -hmm. when you have the Medicare program actually two years in a row now talking about cutting payments to physicians at a time of big inflation and right after the physicians have lived through the COVID pandemic, all this anti-science disinformation we've talked about, some of those things really are, are driving some physicians out of practice. We had data last year that one in five physicians coming out of the pandemic was telling us that they were gonna either leave practice or do something different in the next two years. That, that is a sign that we have a pretty dysfunctional healthcare system that is not supporting doctors and patients hmm. together. All right. Whew. Is that enough for you? We'll come back and talk about some other key issues. Stay with us. You know, I know that we wanted to get to some uh, advocacy issues, and, and, and we shall, but it, it dawns on me the other thing that is interesting about this trend towards specialization and not enough primary care doctors, I think one of the things that, that patients find a lot of uh, uh, trouble with is making sure the specialists are talking to each other, right? And, and so I, I know that technology is there, and I know that, uh, you know, if you're in one group, 
so to speak. You know, uh, if you're in one computer system and specialists can talk to each other, the notes get shared. But oftentimes, you know, you're going to Boston for this, you're going to South County for that. You know, you're mass, you know, right. Are you, are you working on those things within the industry? So, uh, the, uh, for a while, the billing was related to how complicated the note was, and you couldn't bill for a complicated visit unless you made a very long note. And there were very uh, complicated. Build by the note. Build by the note. So you had to ask three different questions about the, the present illness and four questions about the past medical history and three que and 14 different uh, systems you had to review. And then and you would make this incredibly long note and then that would come over to us and we'd have to sort of find the clinically relevant information for us about the patient's visit to the cardiologist or the oncologist. And that, fortunately, that has changed. So now you can take care of someone. If it's a complicated patient, you build it as a complicated patient. If it's simple, you build it as simple. So, so that piece uh, has improved. I, I think we've seen some real progress on sort of information sharing. Uh, Congress passed something called the Cures Act a few years ago, and, and we pushed hard for some of the provisions in there. And we were actually seeing the companies that make those electronic health records, those computer systems that patients see doctors using that weren't talking to each other, some of that was the actual vendors, the companies that make those, making it impossible for us to share notes across systems. And so this is mandating that that, that has to happen. It actually came up, I don't know if you, I, I'm sure you're busy and traveling, but the Republican debate happened this week, and Governor Burgum, who's got you know no traction in that race, though, was like pounding, saying, I know what the problem is in health care. It's the, it's, it's the, and he, and he talked about the vision of the doctor turning away from you and typing into his keyboard. Um, the stuff he said, those systems don't work. And, and so to, he was. Yeah, he, he they was, didn't when they came out. Yeah. We, we have made a lot of progress. Um, and so that has gotten better. We still got some work to do. And it's funny, when we teach medical students, I think we probably share this. Just it's a basic thing now to teach them that you need to spend most of your time face to face with patients and not face to face with a computer. But we've gotten the systems yeah. to be better. Yeah, it helps on the way. There's a, well, you put the computer in front of you and then you talk well, to the no, patient. Actually, like there's a system that I've saw demoed that, w that I might get, actually get my hands on pretty soon that's a, essentially a microphone. And so it uses some AI and will, you have a natural language interaction with the patient about their medical problems. You talk through your physical exam, the lungs are clear, the heart's regular, et cetera, et cetera. And then you say, here's what I think this problem is your first problem and here's what we should do about second problem. And then within about 20 seconds, uh, using artificial, yeah, have you seen this? with artificial intelligence, it makes a, a natural language note that makes sense to. You worry about the threshold though? We're all, this, this AI stuff is, 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 is right now being presented as user friendly, yet the AI folks are all scheming on, on you know, taking over the world and, and, and problems that, uh, yeah. predictions of, you know, you're gonna tell me exactly when I'm gonna croak based on an AI prediction. I'm not ready to jump into Healthcare that. Healthcare is like that anything thing, right? else you know? with AI, AI right now. We are seeing really exciting new uses that are gonna help us take better care of patients, and we're seeing uh, some, some things that are all hype that actually haven't been validated. They don't do what they promised they're gonna do or that actually even can cause harm. So mm -hmm. I think we're spending a lot of time in organized medicine actually working on the legislation and the regulatory policy to help make sure that the good stuff that can help patients gets out there and that we and that we don't advance some what's, of the bad what's stuff. the urgent advocacy that I'm told that the, the Rhode Island Medical Society is concerned about well so uh, part of this uh, practice environment uh, uh, and restrictions on practice is is very important so so uh, uh, being uh, able to uh, have a uh, a, a clearly uh, transparent process for getting uh, medications and procedures approved with the insurance plan. So we've just made some good progress with that with the legislature using the Office of the Health Insurance Commissioner to make the process more transparent and these unnecessary delays for prior authorization that we think are really uh, largely driven as efforts to delay care and save money for by the insurance plans moving into an environment where needed care is delivered at the time that it's needed. Well, should we be looking at a different model? Should, should we be in a situation where we just pay a, a, the local doctor retainer, whether we need him or not, and like a lawyer, and and just you know be on a payment schedule, like you, have, you got a car payment, you got a mortgage, you got a doctor payment, so the business is getting regular cash flow, uh, or, or you still I health mean, insurance makes sense because when somebody gets really sick, it can be you know it can be catastrophic yeah. and expensive and, and expensive to take care of patients with all of our modern technologies. So we believe everybody in this country should have insurance and, and so that they have access to health care when they need it. Now, 
having different pay payment models for how insurance companies and the government pays physicians and flexibility with that, we've actually really tried to innovate in that space so that physicians actually can get paid for doing innovative preventative work that's not always covered in the, in the current model and, and a bunch of different specialties, whether it's oncology or primary care or gastroenterology or anything else have put forward a lot of these alternative models. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, doing things differently, yes. Um, getting rid of insurance, probably not. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, slightly off topic of where we, were, we thought we would be going with this conversation, but there's a project underway in Massachusetts that's still in developmental stages. But you buy insurance just in case something happens, right? You buy car insurance in case you have an accident. You don't need car insurance if you don't have an accident. Mm -hmm. You buy insur health insurance in case you get sick. Primary care and the public and the sort of public health health maintenance part of primary care isn't just in case. Everybody needs it. It's nonstop. Everybody needs it. So that doesn't really have to be insurance. We know how many people are in the state, in the country. We know what it costs to do the preventive stuff for them. So why even put primary care in health insurance? How about just have primary care be funded? We saw the, That's interesting. We saw the, the gap for access to care at the beginning of the pandemic. Obviously, the people without doctors and without even clinics or clinics that were giving COVID vaccines were highest risk because they were living in dense population. They were essential workers in the sense that they didn't have a choice about whether they're going to work and spreading COVID amongst each other and that affected all the rest of us. So if yeah. we had a block of support for primary care for everybody, it's not insurance. You need a colonoscopy, let's get you a colonoscopy. One, of, one of the things that the Affordable Care Act actually did for the plans Look, that it covered was to actually put all of preventative care into saying, hey, patients shouldn't even have to pay a copay or a deductible for that. Mm -hmm. And we actually saw those important things like colonoscopies and all that preventative care. Uh, patients did more of it when they didn't have to. All right. pay uh, fi price. Final thought from our, our guests when we come back to this. Only, only got uh, a few seconds here. Are you loud enough? Is your industry loud enough politically? You're complaining about Congress for at, son, at certain junctures. I only have 20 seconds for the chief of the national Incredibly proud doctors around the country are standing up for, the, for their ability to take great care of their patients. So um, we're seeing grassroots efforts all over, and it happens in state houses. It happens in Congress. It happens with the administration. It happens in court cases. Uh, the AMA, state medical associations, individual physicians doing a great job, but we got to keep speaking up. Yeah, keep doing shows. Thank you. Uh, welcome back to town, and congratulations on the good work with Thank the society. You very much Appreciate it. Us. Don't be a stranger. Uh, final word, and we come back. Let's do this. Hey, now that we have the doctors, the dentists are next, so stay tuned for that. See you on the radio next week. Bye.